Hi everyone, this is Jeff Elam from Argonne. I'm going to be talking to you today about particle atomic layer deposition at Argonne National Laboratory. I wanted to start out by thanking Forge Nano for inviting me to speak at their summit. And also, I wanted to thank all of you for dialing in and listening to my presentation. I will begin with a brief introduction. I will then discuss three different applications for particle ALD catalysis, energy storage, and clean water. Next, I'll talk a little bit about equipment for particle ALD. And finally, I will conclude. So let's start with the introduction. I know that we're all familiar with atomic layer deposition, but it's always good to briefly review the salient aspects. Uh, so it is, of course, a way to grow thin films using chemical vapors and self-limiting reactions between those vapors and a solid surface. There are many different materials that we can grow by atomic layer deposition, including oxides, nitrides, metals, and other materials. And that allows us to use these materials to pursue a broad variety of applications. And then finally, uh, and perhaps most importantly for today's summit, we can coat non-planar surfaces. So ALD can precisely coat 3D objects, including particles. I wanted to talk briefly about a related technology called sequential infiltration synthesis, or SIS. And that's most easily done by comparing it with atomic layer deposition. So shown here schematically is a pulse sequence for a hypothetical ALD material AB, where we're growing that AB material on top of a polymer film. So the polymer is a substrate and we're growing a film on top of that substrate. If you extend the exposure conditions, so you use longer exposures and larger partial pressures, then those A and B precursors can diffuse into that polymer film. And if there are reactive sites for those precursors, they will react and they will stick. And if you uh, repeat that process, you'll end up with a hybrid material where you've infused it with the inorganic AB. And this is typically done at lower temperatures compared to ALD so that you don't melt or degrade the polymer. So I'll refer to SIS later in the, in the presentation. So let's talk now about some applications for particle ALD. So the applications for particle ALD are many and they're diverse. I list here some of the applications that we're pursuing at Argon. These include catalysts, lithium ion batteries, and sorbents, and the other items on that list. Uh, of course, the, if you include the research going on at other institutions, that list is much longer. It includes things like pharmaceuticals and explosives and propellants and so on. So a lot of different applications for this technology, and that, of course, is what motivates this summit. So let's start out by talking about atomic layer deposition for catalysts. If you wanted to engineer the ideal catalyst, you'd want to be able to start with any high surface area substrate. So that's shown by this yellow circle here. You then want to have the ability to put down a support on top of that substrate. That's signified by this, uh, by this red shell. And that support would be perhaps a metal oxide that is not the active catalyst, but it participates in the catalytic reactions. It's maybe a co-catalyst. Uh, on top of that, you'd want to be able to have small monodispersed nanoparticles shown by these uh, blue uh, dots. So they should all be exactly the same size and all just the right size to catalyze the reaction most effectively. And then finally, you'd want to have some means for preventing sintering. So stopping these particles from agglomerating uh, as the catalyst is undergoing chemical reactions. So we can do this by atomic layer deposition. We can, of course, start out with any substrate. This can be a piece of silicon, or this can be a high surface area powder, or this can be a membrane. We can then grow the support layer by atomic layer deposition because there are many metal oxides, for instance, that we can grow by ALD. We can then uh, grow nanoparticles on top of that support. So there are a lot of ALD metal processes that naturally form nanoparticles rather than a continuous film. And then finally, we can add another layer on top of that to stabilize these nanoparticles. So let's talk about some of these different aspects. 
So palladium atomic layer deposition can be accomplished using uh, palladium HVAC and formaldehyde. And we're going to look at that reaction on top of an aluminum oxide surface. So our support here is going to be uh, aluminum oxide. And what we notice uh, is that the thickness as a function of the number of palladium ALD cycles is not linear. It starts out very low, and then after some period of time, it becomes linear. And so we can divide the growth into uh, the, uh, the nucleation phase and then the growth phase. Uh, and then uh, this happens at about 100 ALD cycles, this transition. Uh, the, you might ask, well, why is this so? Why doesn't it just grow uh, at a steady growth rate right from the very first cycle? And of course, the answer is that it's not growing as uniform layers, it's growing as particles. So shown here on the left is a transmission electron micrograph, and these uh, white dots are the palladium nanoparticles. Uh, we have a zoomed in uh, higher resolution TEM that shows that the uh, palladium nanoparticles are uh, about two nanometers in size, one to two nanometers, and they are uh, uh, crystalline. The histogram here on the right hand side extracted from the TEM image shows that they are, again, between about one and two nanometers in size with a, a fairly uh, tight particle size distribution. So we do palladium ALD and we end up with small monodispersed palladium nanoparticles. And if we uh, test these using uh, catalytic reactions, we find that, for instance, in methanol decomposition, they are about twice as active as palladium nanoparticles made by conventional means, made by incipient wetness. Let's talk now about overcoating the palladium nanoparticle catalysts using ALD aluminum oxide. We're going to probe these catalysts using this methanol decomposition reaction that's going to be our measure of the catalytic activity. We prepared a series of samples where we overcoated the palladium nanoparticles with different numbers of aluminum oxide ALD cycles. What we found was that after between 30 and 35 overcoating cycles, the conversion had essentially dropped to zero. And that's not surprising because at that point we had completely buried the palladium in aluminum oxide. However, for smaller numbers of overcoating cycles, the catalytic activity was maintained. And it was actually maintained in a special way. We found that we had turned off a coke forming catalytic reaction which made the catalyst uh, more selective towards this methanol decomposition, which we wanted. So, we want, so what we accomplished was to create a catalyst which was uh, more selective. But we did something else. We also greatly improved the thermal stability, and that was the whole motivation for doing this overcoating. Uh, and that improved stability is shown in this pair of TEM images. On the left, we see the palladium nanoparticle catalyst without the overcoat after it's been heated to 500 centigrade for six hours. And these white spots that you can see that are very obvious, those are 10 to 15 nanometer particles. So those have, have sintered tremendously compared to their initial size. In contrast to that, on the right-hand side, you can barely see the nanoparticles all because of the scale for this TEM. And so they've maintained their one to two nanometer size. So we find that the ALD aluminum oxide uh, not only inhibits, uh, 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 not only reduces the coke formation, but also inhibits the sintering. Let's talk next about ALD for lithium ion battery cathodes. So the cathodes in lithium ion batteries are made out of powders of material like lithium cobalt oxide. And as everyone is well aware, if you charge and discharge a lithium ion battery many times, the capacity goes down. And one of the mechanisms responsible for this is degradation of the cathode powders. It turns out that if you coat these powders with thin films by atomic layer deposition, you can improve their cycling stability. So you can prevent this uh, loss of capacity with cycling. And in some cases, you can also achieve higher capacity and even uh, higher rates. Some of the mechanisms that are responsible for this improvement are, for instance, preventing contact with the electrolyte and scavenging HF that would otherwise degrade the cathode. So here are some examples uh, from Argon of using ALD thin films. The top two graphs are ALD thin films of a tungsten carbide aluminum fluoride nanocomposite. Uh, 
on lithium cobalt oxide powders. And in these graphs, the red data sets are for the coated materials and the black data sets are for the uncoated materials. And you can see as a function of cycles, we have better stability with the ALD coated materials. And as a function of rate, we can also get uh, higher charge discharge rates. The lower graph is for a different system. It's ALD lithium aluminum oxide on a lithium nickel manganese oxide cathode. And again, uh, if we look at the, uh, the blue data set is for the lithium aluminum oxide. If you compare that to the uncoated uh, powder, the, the, the black data set, you see that we have higher uh, uh, capacity retention versus cycles. So this is not true for all coatings on all cathodes, but there are many examples where ALD films uh, can be very beneficial. The final application that I wanted to talk about is ALD sorbents. This is probably unusual in a particle ALD summit, but you'll see later why I included this. So if we start with polyurethane foam and we use the SIS, sequential infiltration synthesis of aluminum oxide, we can put a thin uh, inorganic layer on the ligaments of the polyurethane foam. If we follow that with a chemical silonization to put down an oleophilic monolayer, then we impart some unique properties to the to the polyurethane. It becomes simultaneously uh, oleophilic, so it will adsorb oil, hydrophobic, uh, reusable, and it's of course inex inexpensive. So this can be used as a sorbent. So this looping video shows the properties of the resulting treated foam. Uh, so the blue liquid is uh, vegetable oil, which has been dyed blue, so you can see it, and it is floating on top of water, and each time that we apply this, uh, this oleo sponge, this treated polyurethane, it rapidly soaks up the oil. So what, what can we use this for? Well, this is a still photograph taken uh, underwater at the OMSET facility. This is a facility for uh, testing and training for oil spill response. Uh, in this photograph, there are plumes of crude oil uh, underneath the salt water and they're impinging on this wall of oleo sponge foam. And in the experiments that we ran, we found that it, the oleo sponge was able to adsorb these subsurface oil droplets very effectively. We imagine that this could be used in a, a scenario where uh, an underwater oil plume needs to be uh, cleaned up and fishing trawlers can drag oleo sponge material in, uh, in a net. Uh, it will adsorb the oil. It can be uh, squeezed out and reused. So this could be a, a highly cost-effective and also efficient way of cleaning up oil. Uh, but of course, we need to make a lot of it in order to do that. And so there's this question about scale-up. One of the difficulties that needs to be overcome to scale up this oleo sponge is shown in this slide. In the experiments that we did to produce the small cubes of foam that we use for our tests, we placed the polyurethane cubes inside of a, a tube the tube was part of our viscous flow ALD reactor where the precursors and the carrier gas were flowing in this direction. And what we found was that the thickness of the coating on the polyurethane depended a lot on the position uh, inside the tube. And in particular, there were thinner coatings uh, downstream. So you know, the question is, uh, how can we do this effectively uh, such that all of these cubes receive the same dose? And we'll talk about that later. So the next part of my presentation is about particle ALD equipment. I'm going to start by describing how at Argonne we've been doing particle ALD uh, in a very straightforward way using our existing uh, tubular reactors. So this is a photograph of uh, an ALD reactor that we use uh, for lots of different activities. It's a general purpose research system. This is a, a wrapped up in heating tape is a, a two inch diameter tube. Uh, there are many projects that use this with many different ALD materials. So uh, however we coat the powders needs to be uh, easily integrated with all the other activities where we're coating other things like silicon and membranes and so on. And so the simplest way to achieve that that we found was simply to take the particles or the powder that we want to coat and to spread them out in a, in a thin layer in a tray. And so uh, in this photograph here, you can see the, the white powder is spread out in that stainless steel tray. And then above the tray is a, a cover that is a, a porous stainless steel mesh that can keep the powder from, from, uh, from exiting the, the tray. Uh, and then this schematic 
uh, over here shows in cross-section uh, that the precursors can diffuse through this wire mesh and then they can then diffuse into this uh, particle bed. So coating powder in a static bed in a metal tray works fairly well. Shown here on the left is a graph where we've taken uh, one gram samples of silica gel, a, a powder with uh, 100 square meters per gram surface area, and we have coated that with aluminum oxide by atomic layer deposition using different increasing uh, TMA exposure times. And we find that the weight gain saturates after about 60 seconds under these conditions. And we calculate that we use about only 30% of the precursor. The remaining 70% uh, flows over the sample and uh, is not reacted. So it's not terribly efficient, but it is simple and effective. This photograph at the bottom shows two of these powder trays, uh, one after another on a, uh, a metal carrier that we can slide into our tube reactor. And it's what we do fairly often is to place pieces of silicon uh, around these uh, powder carriers so that we can afterwards measure the thickness of the film using ellipsometry. So one way to coat larger quantities of powder is to use a larger tray. So uh, we have a Benic TFS 500 ALD system, which is also a uh, viscous flow, uh, cross flow type arrangement similar to our tube reactors. So if we insert a, a larger tray into this system, we can coat it in just the same way. And in this uh, example, there's about 20 grams of uh, a cathode powder on this four inch by eight inch tray. So one of the disadvantages of coating powder in a static bed by atomic layer deposition is shown in this photograph. In this example, we were coating silica gel, which is white, with ALD tungsten, which if it coats the silica gel uniformly should appear black. Uh, and the top surface of the silica gel is coated and appears black, but once you disturb that powder and you start to reveal some of the powder underneath, you can see that it is not coated. So under these conditions, uh, there's a non-uniform thickness of the coating as a function of depth into the bed. Uh, and that's a result of the non-uniform uh, precursor exposure you get. Because the precursor needs to diffuse from the top down, you're of necessity going to get larger exposures on the top. So one way to alleviate the problem that I just described is, of course, that you can agitate the powder while you're coating it. So to accomplish that, we have this rotating drum fixture that we designed for our ALD tubular reactor. So it's a, a long, skinny rotating drum, and the outside of it is made of a uh, 325 stainless steel mesh, so it can contain particles that are greater than about 40 microns in diameter. Uh, we use a rotary feed-through to couple this rotating drum to a motor that's on the outside of the chamber which can go between zero and 120 rotations per minute. And this can hold about 100 grams of powder. So the graph here on the left shows the effect of using the rotating drum powder coating fixture to perform aluminum oxide atomic layer deposition on silica gel powder. And in this case, we're using about 1,500 square meters of powder in the, uh, in the powder drum. And we measure the saturation time, that's the time to saturate the trimethyl aluminum reaction, as measured by uh, weight gain, the change in weight uh, after coating the powder. And we find that in the absence of rotation, the saturation time is about 160 seconds. But if we rotate the drum at even just a few RPM, that saturation time drops down to about 100 seconds. We next performed tungsten atomic layer deposition on the same silica gel. And we found that when we remove the powder, uh, when we use the powder drum, the powder came out uh, black and uniform, indicating uh, a uniform coating. Uh, and in contrast to that, when we took the powder from the fixed bed, we found that it was uh, both black and white. So as described earlier, um, there's a lot of the silica gel particles that just don't get coated at all, those particles that are below the surface of the, of the layer. So the powder drum provides faster satura saturation, um, improved coating uniformity on the powder, and we achieve about 80% precursor utilization. Um, I should mention that in this conference, there is a poster that is presented by Matthew Coyle that describes the 
powder drum uh, in greater detail. And I'll also mention one final note, which is that even though we get better uniformity by, uh, by rotating the powder drum, there still is the, is the possibility of having non-uniformity in the direction of flow. Because even when you rotate the powder, there's no way to get around the fact that the precursor is going to first uh, is going to first encounter the powder uh, upstream, and then it's going to flow downstream, and in, in so doing, it will become depleted. And so downstream, you will always have uh, smaller precursor exposures. So one way to overcome that problem that I just described about the precursor uh, exposure non-uniformity in the direction of flow is to use a different ALD system. This is our powder coating reactor. The rotating drum fixture I just described is something that fits into our existing ALD systems and so is very convenient uh, and because it, the ALD systems don't need to be dedicated to a particular purpose. This PCR, this is dedicated just to coating powders. And so some of the uh, features or some of the specifications are listed over here. It holds about a kilogram of powder. It was designed to coat about 10,000 square meters of surface area. It uses high pressure static dosing. Uh, it has ways of handling uh, temperature transients. Those are the heat that is generated as a result of the exothermic ALD reactions, uh, because if that isn't done properly, you can the powder can get quite hot. We also use uh, direct liquid injection of precursor and there is an easy way to get the powder in and out of this system. So this next slide just shows schematically uh, how this PCR uh, operates. It's essentially a, a hot walled uh, chamber with a, a large static volume. It's large so that you can fit a large number of precursor molecules in there at any one time. And in addition to that, uh, so it's got, a, it's got a rotating drum inside. And in addition to that, it has a a method of convection for circulating the precursor during a static dose. And it's this convection that allows us to achieve more homogeneous precursor exposure because there's not a, a single direction of flow the way that there is in the uh, viscous flow reactor. So we're able to achieve about 100% precursor utilization with this system. And as I described it, it accomplishes more uniform precursor exposures compared to the tube reactor. All of the particle ALD equipment that I've described so far is equipment that we built ourselves so that we could do bench scale research in our labs where we were primarily interested in the properties of the materials that we were making. We were trying to make catalysts and cathode materials that had unique properties. However, it's also important for us to try to translate the materials and the processes that we come up with to industry. And in order to do that, we need to operate under conditions that are closer to those used commercially. And so one example of that is uh, that a particular implementation of particle ALD is the semi-continuous process at Forge Nano. And to try to be more close in the pressure flow conditions, we've recently purchased a fluidized bed ALD system. So I thought I would leave you with one crazy idea of what we might do with a fluidized bed system. And it requires that we expand our definition of particles somewhat to include uh, polyurethane cubes. So I mentioned we had this difficulty coating polyurethane in a cross-flow ALD system because we were getting non-uniform precursor exposure and that was leading to non-uniform coatings. If we could tumble these cubes in a fluidized bed, that might be a way to try to homogenize the precursor exposure and we might end up with uh, a better product. And ultimately this would then be a way that we could clean up oil slicks from below the ocean surface. I'll let you decide if you think that's a practical thing to do. So let me just conclude by saying there are many, many applications for particle ALD. I just told you about a few and I'm sure that you're gonna hear many more in this summit. Uh, also that bench scale research is not that difficult to accomplish uh, in particle ALD, uh, especially if you're not so worried about optimizing the process, but you are concentrating just on coding particles and doing research with those particles. And then finally, uh, that scale up and commercialization will 
will require specialized equipment that goes beyond things like fixed beds and even maybe rotating drums. As you might imagine, many people contributed to the work that I described in this presentation. I will not read out the list of names, but I'll let you read them yourselves. In addition to that, we had funding from a number of different sources. I will just point out uh, funding from the IACT, uh, Catalysis EFRC, as well as the SEAS Energy Storage EFRC. Both of these EFRCs are funded by the Department of Energy. Thanks very much for your attention.